All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the State of the School Address. My name is Stacy Glaus, and I am the Chief Strategy Officer here at Breck School, and I am pleased to welcome Dr. Natalia Rico Hernandez, who will be presenting us with the State of the School this evening. Dr. Hernandez, over to you. Thank you so much, Stacy. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the State of the School Address. Thank you for making time today. Um, we understand, I understand completely that it is a busy time. We are all inundated with Zoom calls and all the rest of it. So I really do appreciate um, all of the families who have taken time this evening to be with us. Uh, as a 10th grade parent myself, uh, I was involved in the college counseling meeting last night and, uh, and know that there are a lot of pulls on our time. And so for you to spend time with us tonight means a lot. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so if for some reason you have to hop off or uh, you just need to see it at a different time, that will be made available to you as well. So I'd like to start off by talking about what the purpose of tonight's gathering is. Why are we meeting? Why is there a state of uh, the school address tonight? Um, and so, Stacey, if you'll go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, tonight, we are really focusing on a high-level strategic look at our school. I'm inviting you to join me for about an hour, I hope, to just think very high-level about Breck and the work that we're doing. It's easy in this moment of crisis to live only in the day-to-day -day and think about only the next minute or what's going to happen when or what's our response to X, Y, or Z. And we are living in that moment at Breck. Um, it's important to note also that we're spending a lot of time thinking strategically about our school. Our, um, our mission guides us. What decisions are we making for the future? And we're keeping an eye on the long game as well. And so that's what tonight is about. Uh, we're going to live up to our outcome statement in order to be the premier independent school in our community and across the country. And in order to do that, We've got to uh, stay strategic and we've got to stay missional and we have to keep our eyes on the future as well as being able to pivot between the decisions we have to make in the day to day. Of course, we understand that many of us as parents or students who are joining us, teachers who are here with us, we have lots of questions about sort of the day to day and how we're responding and how we're navigating um, COVID, for example. So I did want to invite you. Uh, to February 1st uh, meeting with Dr. Anderson, Dr. Paul Anderson, as you know, who is our consulting physician. He's joining me on Monday, February 1st at 4.30 for parents. Um, we invite you to a meeting that is uh, specific about our COVID response. And, um, and also for those of you who are interested um, and I invite everyone in our community, uh, we, uh, we have partnered with Design Impact as a consulting firm to help us assess and, and look at our practices around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to have an opportunity for you as parents to hear about their discovery findings at this time on February 24th. So what, would have, what have we learned thus far? and where are we headed, and that will be a meeting on February 24th. So knowing that, I hope allows you to join me to think very strategically about our school for tonight. So what's on the agenda? On the agenda tonight is, uh, is some information that we get from the National Association of Independent Schools on the outlook. What, what, what are things looking like across the country? What's the national outlook? And then we'll look at trends that are regional trends, more local trends. Uh, what do things look like for Breck? We'll spend a little bit of time on our blueprint for strategic actions. Candidly, we're gonna spend most of that time looking at our academic innovations. And then we will have time for questions and discussions. I know a lot of people call it the q and I call it the Q&D because we will uh, hopefully be able to have as much discussion around the questions that you ask as anything else. So what does NAIS say about the national trends uh, for independent schools specifically? We'll look at some demographic trends, we'll look at economic outlook, and specifically we'll think about it in the context of independent schools. Much of what we see in the media and the news uh, is surrounds public schools or public charter schools, um, and that's important. It's important for us as educators to stay informed about all trends across all sectors of education. But tonight, I'm going to focus on sharing information with you that is specific to independent schools. So the economic and demographic outlook for um, independent schools nationally, the indicators that we're looking at that we want to pay attention to, 
Um, economically, it's important to remember that uh, that the unemployment rates that sort of skyrocketed during COVID, uh, the, the thinking is that those unemployment rates will stay elevated nationally post COVID as well. That there's gonna be a lag, that there's a tail of recovery that's going to be quite long. Um, nationally, those are the trends. Uh, National Independ National Association of Independent Schools. Um, this actually comes from their book called the Trend Book. They put it out every year, um, and so most recent, their most recent trend book. Uh, that's where this information comes from. Based on information from the past recession, so they looked at information from the past recession to make predictions about what may happen now, understanding that it's very different. So 2008 to 2020, 2021. Um, sorry, go back, Stacy, for just a quick second. Um, based on that information, the greatest economic impact um, is, is taken on, usually the negative impact is taken on by those who are in the highest bracket of income and the lowest bracket of income. We did see that also in uh, in COVID starting in March uh, for us, certainly. And then um, the impact for independent schools across the country, as I said before, will have a lag. We're gonna see COVID related economic impacts uh, well into next year and, and beyond. Uh, demographically, for millennial parents, what we're seeing across the country is that millennial parents are typically more diverse uh, they have fewer children and they're less financially secure, at least for now. I don't think that's a knock on anyone in particular, but it certainly gives us an indicator about how millennial parents choose uh, potentially to spend their resources. Um, and also they are more transient. They, millennials tend to move around the country much uh, more freely than others. Uh, these are just indicators that are important for independent schools to think about. Um, and then finally, uh, it's interesting to note that they indicate that the population in cities, in large cities, uh, will diminish and that people will move to the suburbs and beyond in search of more affordable living, um, living opportunities, living uh, arrangements. Now to the next slide. If we look at um, specific to schools, what happened in 2008? Uh, just as a way to think about and to question our practices in independent schools looking forward in response to the current crises. Um, in 2008, we noticed that enrollment decreased. Uh, so the median enrollment for National uh, Association of Independent Schools uh, went down. There were the largest decline was in lower schools. Um, I think that was also seen in our region and especially in K-8s or elementary schools, uh, independent schools across the country, they saw the largest decline in enrollment. Applications also decreased. So interest in independent schools decreased um, in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, independent schools responded by um, increasing the acceptance rates, their acceptance rates, and also many independent schools looked international to recruit students internationally to their schools at that time back in 2008. Attrition rates also increased back in 2008, 2009, 2010. So the big question is, will these trends, based on what we know from that crisis, will these trends continue for us uh, here now as um, independent schools nationally, but then also more specifically in our region and at Breck. What, what, is the, what does the outlook look like nationally in response to the pandemic that we're facing? Um, and how does it look in the Twin Cities? So good. the good news is that the economic outlook in the Twin Cities um, is looking a little bit better. So this data is, I'm sharing with you comes also from the National Association of Independent School. Their data gathering tool is called DASL. Um, and that tool has a specific market view that allows us to put in um, a, a, a particular region and then get data based on that particular region. So this data comes to you specifically between the years 2020 to 2025. So what's the outlook in the next five years? But then the other thing that I've done is that we've looked at the, the surrounding zip codes. So roughly 20 uh, minutes away, that's sort of, it's a distance, uh, it's a an indicator by distance. So zip codes that are within 20 minutes of Breck School within the next five years, this is what the economic outlook looks like for us more specifically. So while we did see that nationally, millennial families have fewer children, uh, for the zip codes that we've chosen that are close to Breck, we see that there's actually going to be an increase in families with children. There will be a general increase in household family incomes. And then you can see on this chart that it's broken down by um, by swaths of income. 
And the prediction is that in the zip codes that are closest to BREC, we'll see some increases in, um, in the economic uh, situation for the families that are closest to us. Another important um, piece of information that is more regional to Minnesota and maybe not specific to the Twin Cities, but regional to Minnesota is the unemployment rate. So just looking at demographically, the potential for enrollment in the next five years, what's that going to look like? Um, you can see here that it's, uh, that it's looking better for Minnesota than the United States. And I would add that it's looking better for the Twin Cities than other urban areas across the country. What does enrollment look like for us specifically at BREC? Recognizing the first thing I wanna say about this slide is that enrollment is much more than numbers. Um, we are our people. And so reducing enrollment and information about enrollment to numbers is difficult, but it's an important data point for us to think about in the context of what the next five years might look like in response to the economic crisis as a result of COVID. So when you look at our enrollment trends, the top chart that you see here uh, is an enrollment chart. It's just how many students do have we enrolled? And you see from 2017 uh, to today, there was a decline. And then last year we saw a nice increase of 1157 is where we are today. That next chart, the second chart that you see there is our application trends. So again, if we, if we think back to the previous slide that talked about 2008 and how the trends in independent schools were that there were fewer applications and therefore independent schools had to respond by increasing their acceptance rates, we see here that at BREC, um, in this moment, we've seen an, an increase in applications um, from 2017 to 2018 to 2019. Uh, I've broken it down there by uh, division, so you can see it by division. Uh, so lower school has had um, a nice increase uh, from 98 to 138 to 167 um, and, and so forth. You can see all the numbers there before you. I, I want to point out that, um, that lower school has seen a modest increase. Middle school from last year to this year has seen a nice, a modest increase. Upper school um, has, excuse me, lower school has seen a modest decrease. Middle school has seen a modest increase and upper school has remained largely flat. And that last number that you see there, the total number of applications, that's not a typo, that is actually, we are on the money. This is as of January 15th, the exact same number of applications last year, 312, as this year, 312. Um, and so, um, this is important for us because we want to see what the what the potential looks like for enrollment moving forward. It's an important indicator for us. And again, recognizing that it's not just the number, but it's the people we bring in and the experience that our people have. This is a picture of what it may look like uh, for next year in terms of numbers, how we're bringing students in. Um, but you might also be asking yourselves, where do our students go? So how is their exit from BREC? What is their transition post -brec. We are a college preparatory uh, independent school that is focused on the liberal arts. We have a strong commitment to high academic excellence. So what, what does it look like? Um, some people call it admissions and then ex-missions. Um, lots of ways to think about this, but what does it look like for BREC? I'm going to focus on 2020 because that's the data that we have as of today, and we have uh, lots of good news stories to tell. Um, regarding our, uh, our students and their college matriculations. So for the class of 2020, a few things to note based on, I know this is very small, please don't try to, to read it, but uh, we, can, we can make this more public so that you can see exactly the information that's listed. It's essentially colleges and universities where our students have gone. So our students last year submitted 200 applications, excuse me, applications to 200 institutions. They matriculated to nearly 70 different institutions in 29 states in the District of Columbia. That's something that we are very proud of. It's a trend that Breck has seen for many years. Our students go all over. You know, I, I want to remind everyone that our mission states that we are going to match students to colleges and universities and experiences post high school, post graduation that meets their individual needs interests and abilities. And we're very proud of the fact that our students apply at so many diverse institutions. Uh, 14 institutions uh, represented last year, 
the first time ever applicants. So, so there were 14 new schools that our students applied to for the first time ever. And for this year, I would say that, you know, I think it would be a mistake to just assume that we're going to replicate year over year. I think 2021, 2022 is going to look very different. And we're keeping a very close eye on what the trends in higher education are looking like and the opportunities for our high school juniors and seniors. Um, so I want to thank the College Counseling Office. They've done a tremendous job of staying um, abreast of what's happening. But back to 2020, a few other pieces of information that'll, uh, that, are, that are great to share. Um, if we'll go to the next slide. I can share with you that um, we were one of only three schools in the world um, and only one of two schools outside of North Carolina and Virginia to have two students who were admitted to and enrolled in some of the most prestigious uh, premier long running uh, scholarships in the United States. So in 2011, we became a school that was able to nominate students to the Moorhead Kane uh, scholarship. So at North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina, and then subsequently also the Jefferson Scholarship at the University of Virginia. And so you see here two of our stellar students really representing Breck well. Um, this is great for Breck. It's great for these students. And I congratulate them and, and I'm really proud to share that uh, with you. A little more broadly at Breck, what else did the rest of the class look like in 2020? Interesting to think about the diversity of opportunities that our students now uh, have. I, in some ways, uh, the world just seems to be getting smaller in some ways, and their access is something that we think about as we move them through BREC and, and get them prepared to matriculate at colleges and universities. Uh, some good news, every BREC applicant to the University of California system uh, was admitted to at least one campus. So if you know anything about the application system for the University of California, um, it is a very stringent process, especially for out-of-state applicants. So we're really proud of that. The admission rates uh, were many times above the global average for, for Breck. So we had very high admission rates all over. Of note, uh, Columbia University, which has a national admit rate of about 6%, 88% of our applicants last year who, who applied to Columbia University were admitted. So it's a very strong showing at Columbia last year. Uh, we had lots of opportunities that were vastly diverse for our students. We're really proud of that. We had eight acceptances and one matriculation to women's colleges, two acceptances and one matriculation to historically black colleges and universities. Uh, four students uh, from our school who, uh, the students, excuse me, from our school who represent uh, the highest need-based aid from BREC performers did exceedingly well in their college applications. This is something we look at just to make sure that the issue of equity is, is following our students through to uh, X missions. So from those students, we had students attending a top five en uh, engineering program, two at top tier liberal arts institutions, an Ivy League institution. Um, so really proud of our students who, um, who had a high financial need, really had uh, impressive outcomes in, in their higher ed um, applications and processes. And it truly is a showing, I believe, uh, our college counseling process is a showing of what we believe to be personalization and press throughout our students' experience at Breck. Um, it really has been a year like no other. Um, and so when we think about all of the indicators that I've shared with you just now, the economic indicators, the demographic indicators, um, the local trends that we're seeing and what we're looking at potentially for 2020 uh, through to 2025, uh, the National Association of Independent Schools does have some recommendations or some thoughts on what it is that's going to make schools uh, successful for the next five years. What, what are the indicators of success for schools that will emerge stronger post uh, the crises that we're experiencing right now? Strong independent schools that will continue with strong enrollment and strong academic program and strong outcomes for their students post high school have strong board head relationships. Uh, they make decisions that are mission aligned and tied to strategy. And so we are very fortunate at Breck that we've been able to maintain decision-making very closely tied to our mission and to our values. 
Uh, we haven't had to deviate from our mission in order to make decisions for admission or anything else in response to the crises that we're facing. Uh, schools that will emerge stronger have very, very strong communication. Um, that speaks specifically to transparency and to clarity in a crisis. Um, for those of you who you know, in, look at your inbox and think, oh my gosh, one more Breck email, uh, I sympathize uh, and I appreciate your tolerance increasing for the emails that we send because we really are just trying our hardest to keep everyone informed. Communication truly is key and the ever-changing nature of the information that we're getting regarding uh, COVID-19 specifically uh, is really elevating the need to communicate quickly, communicate often, um, and, and keep people informed uh, with transparency. Importantly, and something that we're going to spend a little bit of time on in just a moment, is that NAIS says that schools that will emerge stronger understand that innovation is, is much greater than technology. There has been traditionally in uh, schools sort of this link. People would say innovation and people would think automatically about technology. Um, and what we've seen just in this last year is that the technology has been here for quite some time. Um, this is not new technology. Being able to do this with you today um, is something that we've had access to for quite some time. It was the, the need that created the ability for us to use this. So when we think in education about innovation, we've got to think much more broadly than computers, much more broadly uh, than what the technology can offer. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, NAIS also says that schools that value diversity prior to the crises this summer, the murder of George Floyd and the reaffirmation that our country has seen a, a recommitment to diversity, equity and inclusion, um, you, schools who hadn't truly espoused a value in diversity are, are, are struggling much greater. Uh, we are very fortunate, Breck, that we have always valued diversity. Um, this is not new for us. We have a long history of it. But what we are having to do is to really pick up a mirror on our practices of inclusion and ensuring that we're creating that inclusive environment that we all strive for. But we're not having to convince people here at Breck that diversity is important. Um, NAIS says that diverse and inclusive community communities benefit everyone. Businesses that fail to foster inclusive workplaces see higher turnover rates than businesses that value a diverse workforce. And we know that at Breck. We know that diversity at Breck will make us stronger, that it is in essence what is different about us all that makes us uh, better and, and stronger when we come together. An academic program that values different perspectives will make our students think more deeply and practice analysis more deeply and understand um, different perspectives as they move on into the world. Again, always keeping an eye on our commitment to a strong academic program, a program that sets our students up for a life of intellectual curiosity, self-knowledge, and social responsibility, which brings me to our Breck context. In order to stay strategic, um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on our blueprint for strategic actions. And what is it that we have dedicated ourselves? What have we committed ourselves to? What are the action steps that are gonna keep our decisions strategic? Because we know that, um, that intellectual curiosity, that idea that our students are not empty vessels waiting to be filled with information that we give them. It's not a data dump when you come to Breck as a student. You are, whether you're a preschooler or you're a ninth grader that's new to Breck or you're a senior, you know that we know that you come to us fully prepared with your own interests, your curiosities, your apprehensions, your perspectives, your opinions, and that those matter and they are valued and they are important to the learning process. Um, Self-knowledge uh, through our Peter Clark Center, we know that students who know themselves as learners fare better. They have a more enjoyable learning experience. They know that success and challenge are both temporary uh, and that we should work through both success and challenge for future successes and challenges. And finally, social responsibility, that students who come to BREC know that they're going to spend as much time focused on their individual strengths and applying those to the greater good as they are thinking about themselves within a community, whether it's their classroom community or their family community or the broader community in the Twin Cities. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on our uh, on highlighting issues, uh, excuse me, highlighting our uh, blueprint for strategic actions. So about two and a half years ago, uh, we moved to a model that um, that took us from 
uh, a strategic action plan that was a traditional strategic planning that was a five-year strategic plan to a more um, flexible, a more dynamic blueprint for strategic actions, where the pillars of that strategic blueprint would stay constant uh, over several years, but that the action steps, would we would evolve them. We would evolve them based on, on the needs of our school and, and even modify as much as necessary um, what it is we need to do to stay strategic and to make sure that our decisions are missional and that the actions that we're taking as a school um, will uh, ensure that we stay on a path that is strategic, um, and so you'll you'll hear you'll hear things that sound like they are very familiar. I hope for those of you who have been at the State of the School Address for several years, this is our third annual State of the School Address. So you should hear some themes that are similar, but you'll hear some examples of how that has evolved and how we've updated, and we will continue to update and evolve year over year. Um, so the first. The first uh, pillar of our strategic action is specifically related to our academic program. Uh, so teaching and learning is our core technology. It's, it's what we do at BREC and where we need to stay focused. Education is a research profession. Our Peter Clark Center for Mind, Brain and Education links research and practice for our teachers. And we're going back and forth in what we know about schools all the time. So at our core at BREC, our academic program is innovative. But what does that look like? How does that live within our school? And how do we continue to evolve that idea of innovation and challenge in our school, especially in the face of COVID-19, especially in the face of crisis, that we're not just spilling, spinning our wheels and spending you know, all of our time and resources on the moment, but actually taking a step back and thinking about what does school look like for a Breck student in response to COVID, but then also in the future, that we are not just watching this moment go by and sort of crossing our fingers and can't wait to get back to normal. That's not how we're approaching this at all. It wasn't how we approached it in March and it's not how we're approaching it now. So we've committed to leveraging the complexity and the opportunities brought on by COVID-19 to innovate our academic program. We have focused on supporting and empowering and enhancing our academic leadership team. What does our academic leadership team look like? How do department chairs work together? How do they lead and evolve and innovate in our academic program? We look at aligning our curricular philosophies. What is our, what is our philosophy around science education, around math education, around arts education from preschool through 12th grade? How does that need to evolve? How do we communicate that? How do we assess for that? How do we plan for that? Um, we also have clearly articulated the characteristics of high quality teachers at Breck, and we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Um, and so with that, understanding that we are looking to the future, I thought it would be uh, that now would be a good moment to share with you a bit of a, a window into the day-to-day -day at Breck in response to COVID. So what do our classrooms look like in this moment? Um, just a very short video uh, that I'd love to share with you, and then we'll come back to a more strategic look at our academic program. What does Breck look like today? Well, we are, we seem to be having trouble with the sound. Sorry for that. Um, how about we send out the video to you post, post our event tonight. Um, it's about, it's again, it's less than three minutes. And so we'll just keep going. Um, but we did want to share that with you so that you could see what the experience for your children is uh, today and how our teachers, our faculty and our staff, especially our faculty have just done a tremendous job, uh, both in March pivoting, but also beyond and throughout the summer and preparing for what uh, what the what school would look like today. Um, we are so uh, proud of the of the work that they've done. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about these characteristics of a high quality Brecht teacher um, and, and share with you that this uh, project started actually in 2019, 2020. Uh, we met with our academic leadership team. We met with our entire faculty and staff during a faculty and staff meeting. We met with board members. We met with students all year long, actually, 2019 and 2020, as I met with groups of people. This was my question. What is it that makes a high quality Breck teacher? What are the characteristics of a high quality Breck teacher? And so we've developed a list that we, that um, I want to share a little bit about with you now. And we'll certainly publish it for you to see. Um, mo most importantly, perhaps, our Breck teachers are mission aligned. They understand that when you come to Breck, you um, you espouse the programs that we have at Breck. You understand what it means to be an Episcopal school and to have a chapel at our school and you participate fully in our chapel and, and live into that spirit. Um, you understand community partnerships. You understand mind brain education in the Peter Clark Center and you espouse those thinkings. You understand servant leadership and that that's part of a Breck education. And you espouse thinking around diversity, equity and inclusion and what it means to be a truly equitable and inclusive school environment. You establish strong relationships with students. You're intellectually curious. Everything we want to see in our students, we want to see in our teachers as role models. High quality teachers at Breck create inclusive communities within their classrooms for Breck. They create communities in their classrooms where every student feels a very strong sense of belonging and where they thrive as learners. High quality teachers at Breck possess a strong subject area expertise and uh, content knowledge, but then also pedagogic, pedagogical knowledge. They know how to teach it. They're they are um, deeply aware of, informed about, and current on the subject that they teach, but they also are experts in how to get that information and that knowledge to students. Um, high quality Breck teachers are committed to their own learning. They understand that a growth mindset is a lifelong uh, characteristic of a high quality uh, member of a community. And so they understand that their own learning, you know, if there's one non negotiable at Breck, it's that you are a learner. If you come to Breck, we are all learning and we're all um, engaged in that together and we collaborate. So I'm not sure that I can think of two better examples of uh, high quality teachers at Breck, especially new to our community. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, two very important people. We have uh, innovation specialists at Breck. We have evolved the position um, of technology and innovation to a position called Innovation Specialists. And so I'm very proud and honored to introduce to you Dr. Julie Calio and Mr. Ben Friesen, our Innovation Specialist, new to Breck, but if you ask them or if you ask anyone around, it feels like they've been here forever. Perhaps it's because of the COVID year, I'm not sure, but one year has felt like 15. So I'll turn it over to you, Ben and Julie, if you could share with us a little bit about how we are innovating um, our academic program at Breck and the work that you all are doing. Great, thanks, Natalia. So as Natalia said, my name is Julie Callio. I am an innovation specialist. And tonight I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about the academic innovation that's happening this year. And my name is Ben Friesen and I'm gonna share just a glimpse of our innovation coaching that we are doing with faculty this year. All right, um, so academic innovation, next slide. I could share a thousand stories about the creativity of students and teachers to explore, create, and share across our community from this year. You've seen virtual performances in theater and music and dance. We've had students making cardboard marimbas at home. Um, you can go back for a moment, Stacey. Um, students have made cardboard marimbas at home to follow along and play along in their world music class in the middle school. Uh, in lower school Spanish, Amy B Vanderdeen began the year teaching students the words for, can you see me? Can you hear me? As distance learners were connecting in their classroom as a way to feel cared for and connected to their learning. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a few examples that really illustrate the kinds of academic innovation that's happening. Okay, next slide. So in fourth grade, every year they do a research project on leadership and leaders. This year, students shared their findings by creating graphic novels using an online tool called Pixton. Part of this work was during the week of virtual learning. Through this project, students moved from consumers of information to creators of content. And this is really a critical skill for digital and media literacy. Next slide. So for interest to action in the third grade, students did interest to action projects during their virtual week in January. 
Interest to action is a school-wide approach for students to pursue their interests, take action, and then share what they've learned. This approach came from feedback and par from parents and students last summer, if you remember to last summer. Um, this student, uh, who you see here, was interested to learn how to knit. So she watched some YouTube videos, documented her progress, and set her next goal, which is to make a scarf. And as an aside, knitting is actually a great way to learn coding and develop spatial literacies. Um, next slide. You can see the energy and excitement that was evident in their Seesaw journals and the students who said they even didn't want their week of virtual learning to end, but we're glad they came back in person. Um, so interest to action projects really grow students' intellectual curiosity as they explore, create, and share. They learn project management skills and they develop a sense of agency that will really shape their career at BREC and beyond. Next slide. So the next example is to show you um, XBlock, which is a Wednesday class for middle and upper schools where they get to take interest-based courses. In just the fall alone, teachers and students have offered 91 different courses. These courses range from producing new forms of media, and next slide please, uh, like podcasting, and there's also been a deep dive into science topics like brains, and there's also been a chance for students to learn new skills like sketch noting. Xbox have also served to support innovation in core academic courses. Next slide. So for example, uh, in the, the 11th grade English teachers were interested for students to create podcasts or videos about a choice book that they read as their semester project. They knew that Marcus Berg was teaching an Xbox class on podcasting, so they were able to draw on his expertise for how to teach it. And the students in the Xbox class were able to be leaders on the project and transfer their skills to a new uh, topic. And this is really the hallmark of deeper learning, being able to transfer your skills to a new project. So as a final example, next slide, um, you may have heard the story about the upper school student, John Cardwell, who used the 3D printer to make mini document cameras for students and teachers to use early on in the year. Um, but what you may not know is that John is also leading a group of upper school students to support 3D printing in a range of ways across the school. One thing that they're doing is working to print these um, that Ben is showing you, these document cameras for all fifth grade students to support their distance learning. Um, and he's also, you can go to the next slide, he's also helping middle school students print their designs for their interest to action projects. And it's really these kinds of connections across the school, across divisions, across departments um, that knit together this culture of innovative teaching and learning here at BRAC. And with that, I will turn it over to Ben to talk about coaching. All right, thanks, Julie. Uh, so there are lots of great examples of innovation going on across campus. And there's just amazing things happening every day in every classroom. Uh, tonight, I'd like to briefly highlight one way we are supporting the faculty through our innovation coaching model and how it's directly supporting and impacting the learning that's happening in the classrooms. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Julie and I, we have this great opportunity to work across the divisions and we get to see things happening in all different parts of campus. And when we are supporting students and, and faculty in that role, a lot of times our work starts with these three important words, which is how might we. Uh, this process is really powerful because it supports teachers wherever they're at, whether they're new to BRAC, whether they're new to teaching, or whether they are a 40-year master teacher. Um, Natalia mentioned the, the culture of lifelong learning, and it really is a, a great way to, to nurture that. Next, please. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different offerings on any year uh, related to professional learning and opportunities available to faculty and staff here. And I think something that's important to, to, that I'd love to highlight is just one way that our innovation coaching model, which is um, very unique uh, and how that is a little bit different. So one way that it's different is it's super personalized. It's one-on-one -on -one support. Julie and I working with different uh, faculty members across campus. Um, and what that does is allows us to tailor our support to what every person's goals are. 
and uh, what a what a great way to uh, work with people. It's also sustained over time. And so what we have the opportunity to do is to work with teachers over a long period, six weeks in our case, where we get to really uh, work closely and have that direct impact on the classroom. And it's definitely like the highlights of our days when we get to spend time in the kindergarten classrooms or in like an AP upper school classroom. And so those days where, um, where we're directly working with the students are, are definitely a highlight. Next. Uh, to date, uh, we've worked with 16 total faculty and logged over 900 hours of one-on-one -on -one innovation coaching support. And uh, just a note, we are literally just getting going. We've just started. And so um, we're really looking forward to um, sharing some of the innovations and creating those connections across the campus where that learning is shared. Next. So this year, um, like any year, there's all sorts of things and, and uh, that, that we're supporting with and on lots of different topics and lots of different tools. And so, for example, this year, there's obviously been a lot of support with uh, hybrid teaching, but there's also all of the things like student engagement or student portfolios. And then um, along with some of those more technological tools, it might be iMovies, Google Classroom or Seesaw. Next. And uh, Julie said up front, one of the things is that there are thousands of examples and tonight was just a great little opportunity for us to give you a glimpse of that and to share how we are supporting our core technology, which is teaching and learning. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Julie. Um, I hope that gave you a, gave our participants here a little bit of a window into the consistent learning that happens at Breck and for our teachers. And one of the reasons um, outstanding teachers love to come to Breck are the opportunities to learn with great people like Ben and Julie and with each other. So thank you so much. Um, of course, the questions always continue. The questions towards excellence and how we can make our, our school a better place, um, how we can be more academically rigorous, how we can provide greater excellence are consistent questions that we're always asking. Um, just as an example, the two questions that are really coming uh, up right now that are very present to our faculty and our staff, to our faculty leaders and student leaders is how will we leverage this moment to improve our daily schedule? Uh, Clearly, next year, we're going to have to make some shifts and changes. And so what's that going to look like? I think this year we learned how quickly we can pivot and how we have to be more flexible in education to provide the kinds of scheduling opportunities that will enhance our learning. And so, I, I you know, there's great um, interest and there's great opportunity for next year in looking at our daily schedule. Another question we're asking right now of our leaders is how might a reimagined space for innovation, entrepreneurship, creativity, research, uh, interest-based learning, how can we potentially create something like that to deepen our students' intellectual curiosity and continue with their academic excellence um, in, in broad and new ways? The next pillar that I'd like to talk about in terms of our strategic uh, blueprint is uh, this one right here. It's we affirm and uphold our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This has always been part of our strategic blueprint since its inception, um, but we did elevate this particular question um, in terms of uh, not only the moment that we're in post this summer and everything that we heard, um, everything that we experienced here in Minneapolis in response to the murder of George Floyd, but also from our own students and our own alumni at the Black at Breck, this actually was elevated prior to, to that moment. And so it really was a convergence of um, experiences that we're living that had us rethink how we are addressing this particular issue. Um, so in partnership with outside consultants, um, we'll talk a little bit more about them, design impact and engendered, assessing our policies, practices, and pedagogy around issues of DEI and the DEI lens. Unifying the direction of activities. There are so many different stakeholder groups at our school, parents, students, teachers, um, who are have been committed to doing um, important work to creating an environment where we are a much more inclusive place. How can we unify um, their efforts and make sure that we're all uh, moving in the same direction with the same understandings? Um, communicating with authenticity and transparency around our school's philosophy and our school's missional commitment to issues of DEI. These are just uh, examples of what we're working on at Breck and, and how we've documented it in our blueprint. 
The next slide that I want to share with you um, is one that I have shared um, in several places. Our faculty and staff um, heard me talk about this. Our Parents Association Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, um, our board, obviously. Uh, but this is my goal. This is this is direction that I've given myself in terms of this work. Uh, the goal that I've set for us as a school, uh, and I'll just read it to you. Breck will consistently implement actions that build a more diverse equitable and inclusive community in order to ensure that all Breck faculty, staff, families, students, primarily students, bring their full selves, feel a strong sense of belonging and thrive as learners. So knowing that that's the goal, what are the barriers that we have in place? Uh, we are a learning institution. We are an institution that is going to consistently evolve. Uh, having been in existence for you know, 183 years, we know that evolution is what's going to keep us current. Uh, and so recognizing that there are barriers to this work that are current barriers is really important. Uh, we know that there is a lack of trust in our community, especially those who are part, represent marginalized groups. Um, there's a lack of trust. We have to own that. We have to own the fact that that lack of trust largely grew from a lack of responsiveness or even potential mishandlings uh, of experiences that our students um, of color and LGBTQ plus students experienced at our school. Um, there's a need for capacity building, both in our leadership, amongst our teachers, quite frankly, our students, our families, anyone who comes to our community, our coaches, there's a need for capacity building in the area of inclusion. What inclusion look like? What, is, what does implicit bias look like? Um, how can I create a more inclusive environment and use the student's voice to enhance the environment where they feel like they belong and they can participate and be their full selves and thrive? The strengths that we have at Breck are many in this area. And I often talk about the fact that if there's any school in the country that could be a national exemplar for work around air, uh, the issues of DEI, um, especially at independent schools, it's Breck. Why? Because we have mission and values that are directly linked to our commitment to diversity, equity, and creating an inclusive environment. Our Episcopal identity um, helps us create that environment because we all know what our chapel looks like and feels like and how it's the life, uh, the, the heart and soul of our school. Those values are values that we espouse across our community, across the diversity of families that come to our school. It's what unifies us. It's what brings us together. We all believe in our chapel. We all know that we respect each other in our chapel and we can have really difficult conversations there. That's a huge strength for us that is not, quite frankly, is not seen at other schools. There is huge community interest community-wide interest in improvements in this area for us. And there is this expectation amongst our population that, there, that we will be an inclusive environment. And in fact, I believe that the response we heard from our alumni this past summer and the activism of our students here within our campus to make us better is because they know we're listening. It's because they know that our families who come to Breck expect of us that their children will feel they belong and that, that we will be an inclusive environment. The three words that I've used to guide us this year are accountability, healing, and integrity. Uh, and all of those have to do with trust. Um, if when we are accountable, we build trust. When we offer healing, we keep trust. And when we live with integrity, we continue to live in a trusting environment. Um, Bishop Michael Curry is someone I've uh, referred to a lot this year. Um, you know, he says that that talking about unity without accountability and without healing is disingenuous. And so we as a school have made the commitment to do this work and to do it well. On the next slide, I'll share with you that, um, you know, a little bit about our partnerships with Engendered and Design Impact. Again, I want to remind you that on February 24th, uh, Design Impact will offer an opportunity to our entire community to join them to talk about our discovery findings uh, thus far. Engendered is hosting a parent education night. Uh, I'd like to thank the Parents Association for partnering with us on that and offering that opportunity. Where are we right now in this process? I have said uh, since since this started, um, I want to uh, I have elevated and, and thanked profusely uh, the school leadership that has been involved with them. Our program directors, Alexis Kent, Heidi Kim, Sarah Floten, and also I want to call out. Um, Susan Bass Roberts, who is the chair of our inclusion committee of our board, who has been absolutely um, an incredible leader for us at Breck, both in establishing the inclusion committee of our board, but also in 
addressing how we went about finding our consultants. Our inclusion committee uh, was spent last year really thinking deeply about the kind of work we wanted to do in this area. And so this is not a typical consultant process. We're not using DI to come in and do surveys and to come up with charts and then tell us what to do with a task list. This is not your typical consultancy. This is truly developing a core team of people on the ground in our school to hear our people's voices, to hear what it is that we want to uh, do better what it is that we are doing well and also to co-create action steps in the future. So we've done the first two phases of uh, sort of a foundation and creating an understanding of what the process will look like. The discovery phase has just culminated. So task, the, the excuse me, the core team and DI has gone through uh, tons and tons of documents and interviews and um, information to get us to the place where now we can do a restorative reflection and a share out on the information that they've garnered. So we invite you to come on the 24th so that then we can move forward beyond that. They're not going anywhere after that. They're still with us and they're co-creating action steps to pivot us to the actions that will um, have a concrete um a, a concrete way of demonstrating our commitment to this and, and evolving our community to be a more inclusive place. I truly believe that this work positions us uniquely in the market, in the market of our region, in the market of our country. I believe that it creates for us an opportunity um, to ensure that our students experience our school differently. So this gets us to the final pillar that I'll talk about tonight, which is ensuring that our student experience reflects our mission and values. It is missional work that we're doing. It's creating an environment where our students will go on to lead lives of intellectual curiosity, self-knowledge, and social responsibility because they've lived within an environment that espouses these values and these beliefs together. And so some of the things that we're talking about um, on this particular pillar, if you'll just go back for one second, Stacey, um, articulating our Episcopal identity well and consistently. We've learned over time that our Episcopal identity is not something that we can just define once and move on. It truly has to live beyond our chapel and through the hallways, our dining hall and our classrooms. Uh, I want to applaud Alexis Kent as head chaplain. Has head chaplain and director of community life, because this is something that continuously needs to be articulated and also evolved um, and also helps us respond to crises in the moment. And it's been a really important part of how we've come together as a community um, and it will continue to be. So that's an important part of this particular uh, strategic action. Um, elevating student voice, really leveraging our students, a focus on our students. We should be thinking about our students throughout this presentation. As we think about all of what NAIS says and enrollment and um, academic innovation, what is our student life here on our campus and beyond? How are they better because they've come to Breck? What is the value proposition that parents and families get for their students by coming to Breck? That is, uh, that's what we are striving for. Aligning our philosophy and practices across our school from preschool through 12th grade around community partnerships and servant leadership. And then finally, and what I'd like to spend a little bit of time here is being an exemplar, truly being an exemplar at our school around the practices of discourse, discourse with dignity and in the context of a global um, environment and climate that is so complex um, and living into that and living up to our mission with integrity in that context. So what I'd like to share with you now is uh, truly creating a culture of belonging. What does that look like? We say a lot of things about it. I'd like to share with you two examples, uh, two concrete examples that have truly come together over the last, um, I would say, nine months or so, um, nine to 12 months. There are two documents that we've worked on, uh, believing fully that policy and practice live in concert with each other. Two documents that we've developed um, sort of uh, ground up our academic leadership uh, focused first on our uh, philosophy statement around civil discourse. It's a philosophy statement. It can be applied to every grade level at our school. Our academic leadership uh, worked hard to create something that would be able to be espoused across our school and across departments. So whether it's a math class or it's an English class or it's a or it's the chapel, quite frankly, it's something that can be espoused and modified to meet the needs of the classroom and, and the age level. It guides classroom practice. It's made to be modified and it's developed by teachers for teachers. And quite frankly, that was the precursor. That was the first thing that we embarked upon. And as we started to roll that document out, what we realized is that a lot of people were asking, where's the line? They were trying to use that statement of philosophy to apply um, 
to apply discipline, to, to react to situations that hadn't gone well. And that was not the purpose of that document. So we set about uh, developing an anti-discrimination policy and again, worked with our academic leadership, shared it with the board, worked with students, worked with teachers, um, worked with a large swath of our community to develop a policy that would both match what we want to create in our community and also be able to be included in our handbook as policy that, um, that would help guide our practice and create a, an environment uh, where all students belong. Um, so this policy guides our disciplinary issues and responses. It has been vetted by our council and it will go into our, um, our handbook. Um, we will share it with you as parents as well. I'd like to share very quickly with you um, this the, the, the purpose of it. If you'll go back one slide, uh, Stacy, uh, sorry, go, the, go to the, uh, the, uh, there we go, thank you. I, this is, um, I have typically spent some time to read this aloud to you. I won't do that at this point, but the, but the point truly for this uh, statement, it's sort of the preamble, the precursor to the, to the policy. And it's just affirming that discrimination has no place at BREC. And if there's one thing that we can agree on as a community across all uh, diverse perspectives, political views, religions, ethnicities, uh, backgrounds across socioeconomic status. You know, once you're at Breck, you're part of Breck. What do we believe in? What do we espouse? We can all agree that discrimination has no place at Breck, and this document is intended to provide us guidance with how to do that. So, Stacy, if you'll go to, um, just go ahead and skip the next slide and go to the following one. Um, one of the things that is important about the policy um, is this idea of a three-pronged approach and. I'd, I'd love to underscore this because it's such an important part of how we'd like to approach not just discrimination or, or uh, issues that come up because of discrimination, harassment, violence, the, all of those things that are such outliers, quite frankly, in our Breck community. That's not typical. Th those, those behaviors are so far outside our um, culture. Uh, and certainly there's, it's important to have a policy for that. But in general, how we approach situations and circumstances that are more in the day-to-day, -day, that that maybe do step outside of our um, expected behaviors, but but that are that are experienced. How should we deal with with um, with with those moments for our students and for each other, for adults as peers, for our parents as peers, for our faculty and staff, um, and again for students with each other and for uh, adults with our students? There's a three-pronged approach that is necessary in every situation, in every disciplinary situation. There should be consequences. Um, consequences are a part of life, and consequences will be applied. And in those extreme cases, yes, in fact, sometimes a separation is necessary. In the typical uh, circumstance, a range of consequences is appropriate. Uh, everything from a conversation to the full range of disciplinary consequences that we have available to us in partnership with you as our parents. Um, education is the second part of that three-pronged approach. You know, consequences by themselves do not change future behavior. I know, I know a lot of people who speed down the freeway um, and just because they get a ticket doesn't necessarily mean they're never going to speed again. <laughs> so consequences by themselves do not change future behavior. Consequences together with education improve the possibility that future behavior will change. We have got to educate each other and our children when missteps are made. We have to offer them the knowledge and skills associated with any behaviors that are outside of the norm that we have for our community at Breck and the values that we espouse. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, especially when it comes to discrimination or harassment um, or, any, or anything that's offensive, quite frankly, in, this, in, in a way that, that harms our community, is repair of harm. That is truly what changes future behavior. It's the idea that you understand what someone went through because of your actions, um, you know, whether they were intended or not, the understanding what, at what, um, what impact your actions had truly does change future behavior along with consequences in education. So that three-pronged approach is something that we are thinking deeply about and working with deans and counselors and teachers and making sure that that becomes um, just a natural part of how we interact at Breck. Uh, finally, 
Uh, I want. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, share with you that we um, have a pillar uh, dedicated to our work at the Peter Clark Center. There's a lot happening at our Peter Clark Center for Mind, Brain, and Education. As I shared with pub, with you um, not too long ago, back in I believe it was November or December, uh, we were given the EE e. Ford Foundation's leadership grant of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's a matching grant to work on um, on a project for. Uh, for our Peter Clark Center, uh, that is the development of um, of an online tool that will help our students better know themselves as learners. There will be more about that to come in the future. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't elevate the fact that we are in search of an executive director for our Peter Clark Center. It's a search that is a global search. We've gotten applicants from all over the globe, quite frankly. Um, some who have reapplied from last year. If you remember, we posted it last year and because of COVID, we pulled that back. We reposted the position. Uh, we're excited to see some of those applicants return to the pool. Uh, and we're working very closely with higher ed institutions that have programs for mind, brain and education, Harvard, Johns Hopkins uh, and Vanderbilt. Now has a new program around mind, brain, and education. So working closely with them to disseminate uh, this opportunity. I would uh, like to thank Sarah Floten, who has done an absolutely fantastic job as interim director of the Peter Clark Center, and share with you that she will continue on as program director for the Peter Clark Center, with the thinking that her uh, leadership of program at Breck will ensure that our classrooms live up to the uh, beliefs around mind, brain, and education, and that our classrooms will be stellar programming um, that is that espouses mind, brain, and education. So let's go to the final slide, Stacy, if you will. Um, actually, let's go back to, I, I do wanna share just a couple more dates and then we'll close with some questions. Uh, the Diversity Career Fair is happening um, on Saturday, March 2nd. Uh, we are hosting this. This is going to be our third annual. Uh, and so we're very excited about hosting that on March 6th. We will uh, be sure to share that on social media and invite you to help us get that word out. And then finally, May 7th, we will be having our blue and gold bash. So mark your calendars. Um, this year uh, has been uh, an incredible year. Lots of learnings, lots of um, takeaways, lots of opportunities for innovation, and never has there been a greater opportunity for philanthropy to be an important part of what we do. So I invite you to join us at the Blue and Gold Bash. I invite you to join us in our annual fund and, and help us keep doing all of the wonderful work that we do. We believe when we come to Breck, we bring our children to Breck, we believe that um, an education is something that merits uh, a great deal more resources than is typically given in schools. And so time, attention, money, all of it, an education like a Breck education is one that requires those kinds of resources. So thank you to those of you who have already given to our annual fund and we invite you to do that. So I think I'm just about three minutes over the hour. I thank you for your attention, your time. Um, and I don't know if we have uh, it looks like we don't have comments yet, but I would invite anyone who has a question to, uh, regarding the presentation tonight um, to please feel free to put that in the chat and we can uh, do a few minutes of questions. Well, I am not a television personality, but I do know that dead air is not good. <laughs> so I um, I will give it another minute uh, and just tell you again how grateful we are that you are partnering with us and that you've chosen Breck as the place where your children grow and learn and develop. Um, and so, oh, I see Mark has popped up on the screen. Okay. Hi, Yes. Yeah, um, highlight Sarah Pierce's question. She asked, how does the work of the innovation specialist overlap with the Peter Clark Center work? And is it part of the Peter Clark Center? Do you want to start with that or you on? I know you're you're dying to answer the question, Mark. I, I would love to to sort of tag team this one. Um, and I think we have our and I, I think our innovation specialists are still there. Let me tell you that the synergy that exists between Sarah Floten um, and our innovation specialist who you meant tonight is incredible. Um, Sarah, thank you for your question. Um, it's a great one. Before they chime in, I will add that there is a great deal of overlap 
um, with the work of the Peter Clark Center and also our DEI work. And so there, the Peter Clark Center truly is at the core of everything that we do. And Mind Brain Education plays an incredible, incredibly important part of all of our innovations. But I'll turn it over to, to Julie and to Ben and Mark. Well, that was what I was going to say, too, that just that the Peter Clark, we're all part of the Peter Clark Center at BRAC. And, you know, the Peter Clark Center is part of all of our work. So um, when Ben and Julie came on this summer, we uh, we met with, uh, well, all kinds of people, but um, but we, we ensured that we were coordinating really closely with Sarah and her work in the Peter Clark Center and that any work that we were doing around coaching or any work that um, any discussions we were having about teaching and learning were not only in line with what was happening in the Peter Clark Center, but actually helping to advance that work um, through the opportunity that we had. So Ben and Julie, I don't know if you want to comment any more on that, but I think uh, there's tremendous synergy of program at BRAC. And I think uh, for me, what it's one of the great things about being in a small um, and tight community that where there's a lot of institutional trust, like we we really believe in each other and um, and understand how our work is complementary. I think the only thing that I would add is that sometimes the technology that we have can open up different opportunities for teaching and learning. And so I think Ben and I bring a lens to say like, well, how could we use this tool in a different way? How could students be creating? And then partnering with uh, DEI work or with MBE work to think about what that teaching and learning looks like in relation to the new tools that uh, teachers have available to them. Yeah, and I'll just mention that um, I made a point that we're cross division. So we get to see this like bird's eye view and see into all the different spaces. And so sometimes when something comes up, you can connect to different people. And like if there's a connection to the Peter Clark Center between this teacher and this teacher and this strategy and this strategy, we can help connect those people, those ideas and share out. There's another question here about um, how innovation and how it's expanding into lower school programming. Uh, Lego Robotics is mentioned here. Um, ben and Julie have spent an amazing amount of time in the lower school and really have gotten to know that program so well in this first year. So maybe each of you can share one example about how you've seen um, your work uh, reflected in the lower school. Sure, I think one of the things I can speak to is um, there was some interest around participating in the hour of code. And so I co-taught with some of the teachers to kind of introduce it and get students logged in, um, walk along with them and walk along with teachers as well about how to think about coding. And again, like those tools open up a little bit different opportunities. And now that I have that relationship with that teacher that we can say, how do we use that coding for something that they're doing in the spring? So continuing that support forward. Yeah, one example I'll just share is briefly in third grade, um, the students, when they got their laptops, one of the things that we did is just spent a little bit of time of talking about appropriate use and digital citizenship and, um, you know, creating something in slides. So incorporating it with a current unit they were working on with birds, for example, and then doing some of that research and appropriate use of the device and and classroom management. So, and and what happens is sometimes you get into that one classroom and then it just quickly ripples out and all of a sudden you're in, uh, your whole week is, is running between second and third grade classrooms, which is always a highlight. Great, thank you. That's all the questions that I see here now, Dr. Hernandez. So I think um, we're set, but I'll turn it back to you to close things out. Thank you very much. I, I can't tell you how much I love that the final questions were um, around the Peter Clark Center because um, when I think about uh, the National Association of Independent Schools um, recommendation that schools that will emerge stronger are those that understand that innovation is beyond technology, it really points to the work that the Peter Clark Center does and mind, brain, and education. The best innovations are in how our students learn to learn those will be uh, the greatest investments that we can make in our, in our children. And so understanding that emotion and interest drive attention, drive memory and drive learning can be applied to absolutely every aspect of a student's growth and development. So I, again, I wanna thank you for taking some time uh, away from uh, the details of COVID response and, and the details of our day-to-day -to, -day to think strategically about BREC to think about the value proposition of BREC, to allow me to share with you in your homes 
um, about our school and where we're headed and what we're working on. So thank you so much for your time. As always, find your person at Breck. If you have other questions or other ways we can be helpful, we are here for you. Thank you and have a great evening.